18 years ago today, almost to the actual time, I would say, one of us was crying walking down a wedding aisle. Usually it's the groom, but in this case, <laughs> it was you. Well, I was sad for you. Yeah, really? That, wow. That sweet bachelor life you can, oh, yeah. gone away. Oh yeah, that wild, <laughs> yeah. wild time I was living. I don't like crowds. Hello and welcome to the picture show with Austin and Phil Rude. I am Phil Rude and I am the dad. I'm Austin Rude. You guessed it. I'm the grandfather. No. You're, <laughs> you're a uh Trite silly fop is what you are. Ho ho ho. ho, ho, ho. I'm the son, by the way. I might, um, I might watch this movie again just to pick up some insults. Yeah, I, I bet they have some good ones. I'm sure I picked up a couple. The, the British are good at coming up with sick burns. That sound like compliments somehow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The one good thing about Victorian England. Anyway, what do we do on this show, Oz? We watch a movie and we talk about it. That's exactly what we do. Um, we watched one this week. We did. Uh, outside of that, do you watch anything else? Uh, just kind of my usual stuff. Nothing yeah. to... I watched Matilda with my boyfriend. Nice. Yeah. A little old school kind yeah. of... Uh, uh, not, not a Halloween, but like a magic... It's like a magic little girl, right? Yeah, yeah. We we weren't looking for Halloween. It was it, just. Is that a rolled doll? It is. Uh, story. Okay. Directed by Danny DeVito. Ah, nice. Yeah. I didn't realize until the credits rolled. I just thought he was in it. You know, uh, people who know Danny DeVito, uh, back in the day, everybody knew him from Taxi. He always played a scumbag, uh, or some sort of weird comedic low life, um. But in reality, like, he was, like, a producer, he was a director, like, he's a really smart guy in, in show business. He's yeah. been around a long time. I think uh, he's a nice guy, too, from he, what I've seen. I, I uh, listened to, I've heard a few interviews with him, uh, Mark Marin did an interview with him, and he's just a very sharp and funny and and kind of a sweet guy, you know, like, right. it's, uh, you know, if you know, you know him as Frank from Always Sunny, Probably more than anything. Right. I, uh, the internet has kind of made him into a meme, too. Sure. So, like, that's my main exposure to him. And then it's like, oh, he's directing a movie. But, yeah, Danny DeVito's an interesting guy. Uh, played the Penguin in the second Tim Burton Batman. Uh, really, uh, really interesting, like, way to play the Penguin, too. Like, Huh. I'd, I've never seen the Penguin on screen yeah, um, well, you're going to in the new one, but uh, his version of the Penguin was uh, was pretty great, like the, sort of this grotesque sewer mutant kind of guy. Interesting. Uh, it was very interesting. It's it's pretty cool. Have you been watching anything new? Uh, Breaking Bad. Um, it's the opposite of new. That's old. <laughs> it, it is old. It's like I said, it's my comfort food. Um, uh. uh we watched a movie on Halloween. We watched um, an Irish film called A Hole in the Ground. Okay. Uh, about a, a single mom and her little boy uh, goes missing in the woods. Horror? Y yes. But a different, just a tonal kind of horror. Okay. Uh, and then she kind of slowly figures out that it's not her son. It's an imposter sort of doppelganger. Ooh, creepy! Uh, it is creepy. It's it's a very different like horror sensibility. Um, it was uh, a very a lot of very interesting ideas. It was well put together. Just a very slow pace. And I I was telling your mom while we were wa or when we were done watching it. I think foreign movies and foreign horror tend to just have a different sensibility, whereas Americans are are like quick, shove everything at them. And, right. and everybody else seems to sort of, it's a, it's a vibe similar to, uh, even probably slower pace than something like the Babadook, um, 
something like that. Just sort of a slow burn where it's, the, the tone of everything is more than... There's a lack of subtlety in American films. Right, yeah. Everything it, is, is sort our, of... Because uh, us as an audience, we don't have the patience for it. It's like, what? I'm 30 minutes into this horror movie yeah, and it's I, just making me feel weird. I don't want to play the ugly American card across the board, but it is just, I think, a different sensibility. There, there's, There mm-hmm. is less subtlety, especially in American horror. I don't think it's just horror, though. Like, if you look at how we do action films and, like, spies. Probably, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm not trying to, like, blame Americans. Uh, no, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example of, uh, I, I think the Bourne movies have, not subtlety, but they are, um, they're not afraid to complicate their plots a little more than the average spy movie. Right. Uh, at the same time, you look at a James Bond movie, and that's not exactly subtle either. And that's not... <laughs> uh, it's MGM. It is an American company. It's a very Brit- It was always a British franchise, though. Right. You know? So it's it's a little give and take. But yeah, I, I there is something about um, a slower burn. I'm going to talk about... When we get to shout-outs, I'm going to talk about another uh, foreign film, foreign horror film that I recently watched a little bit. Okay. Um, we will get to that then. But for this week, we watched the 2020 Victorian era rom com Emma. Emma with a period. Emma with a period. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what that's about, but. I don't know. There it was. Uh, this movie is about a well meaning but selfish young woman who meddles in the love lives of her friends. And it stars Anya Taylor Joy, second movie we've seen her in. Johnny Flynn, Mia Goth, Callum Turner, and the great Bill Nye. Not Bill Nye, the science guy. Bill Nye. Well, that would be fun, too. Uh, it would be fun. Who, uh, Anna Taylor jo- Joy? Anya Taylor Joy is Thomason from The Witch. Uh, I thought I recognized I, I her. I recognized her, too, and I couldn't place it until I was doing show notes. And I'm like, oh my god, of course, <laughs> it's her. Uh, we should have known. And it's it's just led me to, uh, you know, like, I've seen two movies with her in it. And it's one of those things where I go, I need to see her in more things. Because she is just, I mean, this is the antithesis of her character in The Witch. Um, but she's just as good in it. I, I, I think she's, like, super delightful. I, right. I, I, uh, in, I In this movie. Um, um, she reminds me a lot of the girl from Super 8. I can't remember her name, though. Uh, that's uh, one of the Fanning. Uh, Ellie? L, L, L Fanning. Yeah. L Fan- yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Um, kind of in that same age range. Probably kind of came up at the same time. Looks wise. It's, uh, uh, it's the blonde hair, probably. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. She's not... I don't know. I saw her, uh, one of her still. She's not actually blonde, I think. Oh, her IMDb headshot, she's a brunette. Either way, um, not really important, her <laughs> right. actual hair color. But uh, her acting is great. Uh, this movie is directed by Autumn DeWilde, and it is based on the novel by Jane Austen. Speaking of Austen... <laughs> great segue. This was your pick. Is that the entire reason you chose this? I'm a huge narcissist, so... <laughs> I wanted uh, my name dropped a thousand times. I'll be looking for more Austin-related movies. <laughs> Austin Powers franchise coming soon. Something with St- Stone Cold Steve Austin, <laughs> um, The Six oh Million boy. Dollar Man, Colonel Steve Austin. Oh, we got them all. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, wh- why'd you pick this one? I've always been interested in Jane Austen. Uh, but, like, recently I've, I haven't been reading as much, and I feel like... A more older book isn't the place to kind of reinvest myself in reading. Uh, it might be a bit of a drag, like I might not be used to that writing style. So I figured um, a movie might be a good segue into like understanding her works better and what she's all about. Okay. And when I saw this trailer in theaters, like... I instantly wanted to see it. There was something about... It just looked fun. Okay. Um, 
which actually my expectation of the movie was a bit different than what the movie actually was. So was mine. But I still liked the movie. Um, okay. So yeah. uh, you've you've never read anything by Jane Austen? I, I have not. I'm not. Uh, this is right. not. A, I'm not passing judgment. No. Just, no. Yeah. Uh, uh, um. I've read a poem by her. Okay. Um. But that's about it. I don't even remember the name of the poem. I just remember reading it in English class. Another segue into Jane Austen w- might be uh, maybe ten years ago somebody rewrote a Jane Austen novel and put zombies in it. They they basically Pride Prejudice and pr- Zombies. Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Yes. Uh. So it is. Uh, I think a lot of people picked that up, and I would be curious to know if that actually turned into a legitimate gateway into people reading Jane Austen, or if it was just sort of the novelty of, hey, here's something you can do with a public <laughs> domain novel. It's you know? very interesting. I don't know what compelled them to do that. It's kind of like the Archie zombie apocalypse yeah thing. it was right around the time of like i think abraham lincoln vampire hunter the the book came out around that same time there was a lot of weird let's just put mythical old tiny horror stuff right uh and and also the jane austen thing was kind of happening the same time like the zombie renaissance mm-hmm. was hap- you know like she, she wrote little woman Woman, right? Uh, no, Women? that was uh, Louisa May Alcott. Oh, okay. This movie has there a was, similar vibe to that. There was more than one female author back then. I find that hard to believe. Thank you. <laughs> there was one, and she... Actually, these were all written by <laughs> men and given oh, female right. pen names. Austin, um, um, hello. Well, Little Women is American, correct? I don't know. I've never read that either. and uh, but it did also have a film adaptation come out last year yeah uh it it gets adapted yeah a lot i like, feel like <laughs> uh, a lot of jane austen stuff does too like it's i think i it feels like and i if i'm wrong someone correct me it feels like one of those things that like pbs uh like great performances on pbs will do an adaptation like a bbc sort of right uh, production of it, like all the Agatha Christie stuff, ends up in PBS's mystery series. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, uh, they they great like their yeah. They uh, like time periods and period feminist pieces, for sure. works. Um, but yeah, I will say, uh, as for expectations, you brought up your expectation. What were what were your expectations for this movie? I was expecting this to be a more outright comedy, because uh, that's like that's a what. Hangover? Not like The Hangover, okay? <laughs> but I thought, oh, they're taking this Jane, uh, Jane Austen novel and making it a little more modern in terms of comedy because the trailer shows practically all the jokes that are in this. Like, okay. it paints it more as a comedy and the movie itself is much more drama-focused, which I don't have a problem with. I, but... I would call this a romantic comedy, It just not in a modern sensibility i think it's very it's probably very true to uh the time period the book was written in yeah like like it's it's sort of light-hearted it is about romance Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of very silly things and again uh, talking about subtlety i think there's a lot of humor in this that's very kind of under the radar um right it's it's not outright laughs it's like it catches you off guard every time right um and it, but that isn't did you feel like you were watching a comedy through it i mean that was your expectation was that it would be a lot more just sort of like sitcom or just more outright jokes right i thought it would be more outright and there were jokes in this but i felt like that wasn't the focus they were just kind of thrown in afterward Hmm. I don't feel like they were thrown in. I feel like everything was organic. I right. just feel Th- like that's it's, probably like I just mean it's not the focus. It's a very dry British kind of humor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I would I would call this the the main focus of it. I would say is not the comedy, but it is not necessarily the story either. I feel like the the main the main focus of this is like a character study. It's all about Emma. It, it is about Emma and how Emma kind of stops being a terrible person. I know that like the 
she's not meant to be portrayed as a terrible person, but I kind of feel like she is very manipulative. Well, uh, well to, like to the point where I, I think she kind of is a bad friend to a lot of people. Yeah, I think that's kind of the point is she's so spoiled by her life. Right. That she hasn't grown as a person. And and I I do like that um we do see her do that. We do see her sort of grow up and become a better person. I on on that note, let me talk about my expectation right. for this. Because I did not want to watch this movie. <laughs> um I don't I, I'm not into Downton Abbey. I don't like Victorian England. It just is for people. That's uh, the American in you, Dad. <laughs> I, it's it's not about. Uh, maybe it is. I know a lot of American people who sort of um romanticize like Victorian England. You know what I mean? Like, uh, oh, look at look at the clothes and look at the. It all looks very proper and very very decadent. And there's this sort of idea that it was this great time period. To me, it looks stuffy and boring and Well well that's kinda terrible. like we we remember the best parts of every era and we sure. forget that while there were people living in luxury, London itself was just an absolute trash town but that, full of pollution. These and stuff. kinds of stories and these kinds of films that are focused on the aristocracy. I, I don't like them. I, I just... I'm like, these are stuffy stories about people... They're never... They're never concerning themselves with poor people, this, mm-hmm. that, and the other. You, you can't relate. So I didn't want to watch this. I knew it was a comedy, and I also know what comedy in that old world English sensibility is. It's like, okay, it was comedic at the time. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. Oh, jolly good, jolly good. You know, like this. Very good use of irony, <laughs> sir. <laughs> but I, I would say somewhere around halfway through this movie, it had its hooks in me. I really liked this movie. Really? I really did. I really was emotionally invested in watching Emma become a good person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and watching more than watching her romance with the neighbor, um, watching that because you knew where that was going, right? I kind of think that's tied, but to kind it. of seeing everything come into being with her, and this is the subtlety again that they she never sat down where it's like you know I've really been thinking about maybe I haven't been it's it's never like a monologue or an inner inner thought where she's telling you exactly what she's feeling and thinking um, where she insults that woman at the picnic. Uh, it is, they never really tell you that it's wrong until it's all over, but you're sitting with it in that moment and you feel bad for everybody involved you feel bad for her you feel bad for the woman and, and you can see on like their faces what everyone is everybody thinking. is thinking it and and it is it is just a a horrific scene where i identified with her i've been the guy who took the joke too far i identified with the woman i've been the guy called out in front of the group before you know what i mean like and you understand and and i've also been the guy on the side who saw somebody take it too far you know what I mean? Like I, I think everyone I has. Think it's a relatable every, Exactly. And and that's I, I think this is that was handled so well, probably in the book, uh, but I'm only judging by the movie, it's all I know. But to see it handled that well on film, I it really was emotional for me. Um that there's the ballroom scene where Everything that I don't like about Victorian England looking stuffy and cold and boring. Everything is lit so warmly. It's shot so beautifully. This movie turned everything I don't like about it around and presented it to me in a way that I really enjoyed. It's engaging. This movie is a little bit too long and it hits a very slow pocket here and there. 
But overall, I really did enjoy this movie, and I'm glad that you made me. I would never have watched this movie if you had not brought it to the table. I'm so glad you said that, because honestly, I thought you were bored. I Like... I, I hit a couple of boring spots, I'm not gonna lie. And it's slow in the beginning. Like, the beginning, middle part... Yeah. ...is... You could cut some of that out. But, even still. Well, there's a lot of trying to understand what is going on. I didn't really understand who Harriet was until... Uh, probably 30 minutes in, I'm like, oh, she's poor, but trying to marry rich. Yeah. Like, I didn't understand that's what her, 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 her role her was. Deal was. Yeah. Um, I didn't understand who the farmer was till partway through. Uh, Mr. Martin, was that the, the guy she ends up with at the end? Yeah. Um, the, the poor farmer that she tells she tells her like, no, don't marry him. Yeah. It's kind of confusing. There's a lot of characters and everybody's kind of looks the same. uh, And and you also don't part of it. (laughs) You also don't have like a face for all the characters. Right. Like there are a few that it's like, Oh, it's just mentioned by name. And it's like, how am I supposed to keep track of this? They're mentioning them, but they're not on screen. We don't see, uh, that mythical guy. Uh, what's his name? The, the the rich... Who she's supposed to marry. Who she, right. Um, we don't see him till like halfway through the movie. Yeah. You know? Th- it, that's kind of tied to how he plays into the plot, but... Exactly. They could have done something like, oh, here's his likeness. Or, or, or a portrait of him or something, yeah. It's just his house. Uh, like, we can't tie him to his house. But that, I think, is also part of it. Like, the attraction of these people is the life that they would have with them. It's not about um it's not about marrying this person, it's about marrying this estate. We see it in her sister and that miserable family. Like that just <laughs> Which, that, that's one of the funniest parts of the movie. It, God, it's hilarious. Her brother-in-law <laughs> is just miserable and 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 it is it is so funny every t- every time they're on screen. Um that really is genuinely funny. And I was really surprised. I was surprised by how much I, I genuinely laughed at a few parts of the, of this movie. Right. Like the snow. It's going to snow. Oh, my God. <laughs> they, all, they all were like, oh, we got to get out of here. <laughs> you know, her, her father, who's always cold. Who, who is the father, by the way? That's, I, that's Bill Nighy. Bill Nighy. Nighy. Okay. Uh, he's a British character actor. He has been in everything. I've seen him in a bunch, and I, like, he's, love him. Uh, he's in Harry Potter somewhere. Right. Um, he's Davy Jones in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. He's CGI'd over, of course. Is he Sher- in Sherlock, too? Uh, maybe. It, it wouldn't surprise me. He's just one of those guys who shows up uh, absolutely Oh, Oh, everywhere. he's in Hot Fuzz. He is in Hot Fuzz. That's yes. what I recognize him from the most. Um, okay. And I believe he's in uh, Shaun of the Dead. I think he's the... He's the stepdad. He's the stepdad. Uh, <laughs> who, who chased him around the garden with a, a piece of wood. Right. <laughs> um, uh, he's in um, He's in a really cool movie called Pirate Radio. Um, Never heard of it. It's a, it's a British movie. Uh, Nick Frost is in it. A lot of people are in it. Um, it's about a pirate radio station that's run off a boat in the, like the English Channel. Okay, and I think in the UK it's called the boat that rocked. Um, oh, I hate when they give something a different uh, name in different titles, countries. And, yeah, it is. It's totally looking at that. you, the philosopher's stone. Uh, yeah, we're gonna. Um, you see that a lot, probably uh, with with foreign movies. Um, it's kind of besides but the yeah, point. Uh, he's at uh, Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, um, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. He plays Minister Rufus Scrim, Scrimgower. Right. He's like the prime minister. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, He's been in Doctor Who. Um, God. Everything. I don't even know what episode that is. But... Uh, uh, in 2010, he was in a Doctor Who episode. Okay. Um, I'll figure that out later. He's in those Underworld movies. He was in Valkyrie, Hot Fuzz, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Jeez, uh, so much British. Oh, uh, 
Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Right. Um, He's the architect who builds Earth. Yes. Uh, he, he won an award for the... Norway. For the Norwegian Fjords. Uh, or Fjords. Uh, it's, yeah. Uh, Bill Nye is great. And just any time I see him show up in something, I am happy that he's there. He's so unique looking and such a great actor. And just, I think he he looks like a mean old man, but I then he speaks and he just seems super charming. Like, you would sit down... Watching them sit, even in those stuffy clothes, sit by the fire and read at the end of this movie. It's just like, <laughs> yes, I would sit by the fire with this old man and, right. and just have some tea or coffee or something. But you have to wait till he sits down. Right, yes. Uh, it's the bring, gag where he yes, stands he's up and then sits down. Sit and, uh, yeah. Um, but, yeah, those are my initial thoughts. And we got your initial thoughts. Let's take a break. And, and do a deeper dive when we come back. We'll do it. Okay. And we're back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Did you... I We had some tea. It was tea time. Oh, well, yeah. you did because you were in your carriage. I was on foot. I did not get there until later. So weird. So How weird. will you ever marry with that attitude? <laughs> so, the hang-ups people have in this movie is exactly why... But but that's real life. People were really like that. Uh, yes. But I think what this is part of the saving grace of this movie is... I feel like this movie acknowledges that it's ridiculous. And is... There's a tone where it's sort of poking fun at how seriously they take these inconsequential things. I, I think that's stemming from the book. I, I, I hope it is. I hope that Jane Austen, uh, being a feminist in her day, was able to see this for what it was. I, I, I know she wasn't the richest person. Um, so, like, and she was popular, and I think part of the reason is people could relate to... Oh, look at how ridiculous these rich people are. Right. Um, isn't it unreasonable that they have all this wealth? Stuff like that. I think there is something to that. Um, I, I did say that I think a lot of stories like this don't ever acknowledge, like, poor people. But I this movie actually does touch on class. Um. With that one character? Not a great deal, but it is there. It's there in the farmer that Harriet ends up with at the end. Okay, right. You know, that that wants to marry her, but Emma is saying, no, you, you need to marry up. You know, you don't yeah. want to marry this farmer. Even though everybody in the region is nice to him. The one guy takes him to help him buy uh, livestock or whatever, whatever he's... Taking him to market to buy. Sure, you know, but, but is, he's not rich. He's not rich, and, and therefore, you know... The the whole point of Harriet is in this program being taught to be a proper lady. Being groomed to... So that she can go above her station, right. and the fact that she would go below is like... And it's so, it's so strange to see that as just sort of an institutional truth. Like, right. yes, this is what... This is what as, as a woman in this time, it really was the only chance at success you had was to marry well. You know yeah. what I mean? Like And on it You could go be a CEO somewhere. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh this is unrelated and probably unintentional, but uh the women who are learning to be proper ladies, uh they've got red coats on and bonnets right. and they look like handmaidens. It tail. looks like the handmaiden's tail. Um which is probably the re- reverse like those types of outfits inspired the making of Hayd- could, could, Handmaiden's I, Tale? I have not seen or read Handmaid's Tale. I, I can't speak to what's inspired by what. Yeah. To me, yes, I did see that because I, I've seen the imagery of it, of course. But um, really, it just, they reminded me of, like, uh, ducklings. Like, right, they're yeah. being walked around. Their uh, uniform. There's almost a military aspect to it, but the way they just sort of wordlessly follow the headmistress around 
and they go over bridges and they go over. It just reminded me of ducklings walking around. And either way, I think it's just sort of like, yes, be in line. Don't question anything. Know your place kind of thing. It's there, what they teach women. There, that There is a lot of that. Uh, but there's also the woman that uh, Emma makes fun of. Right. That's who I meant. And, um they, they they acknowledge that she used to be richer. She lost her, her money. And that is that is the one that everybody they still include her almost out of pity. Like But they make fun of her. They're like yes, they're like she's our friend because she used to be one of us. But she's not one of us. It it's a very right. strange, almost hypocritical stance that the I feel like the entire story sort of takes that stance with the characters. Like, and, and I'm not saying the the movie is classist. I'm just saying like it's very true to I think how these people probably were at the time. It's the movie is seeing it through their lens, right. so it has their uh, prejudices. I I think so. Yeah, it's the only way that they can still. I mean, you can hang in with Emma. Even as you're watching her manipulate people that she is friends with, you know, otherwise she's a very unsympathetic character. They right. have to they have to draw you into and make you understand her world. Right. If she was just this horrible person to everyone she met, right. then you wouldn't care. Um, and like she is a pretty bad person, but it's more subtle than that. It's poking fun at people it's ignoring her responsibilities it's manipulating her her uh harriet to stay around right even though like she could have been married off by now right and she thinks she's helping these people though too because at the same time she wants harriet to marry into a good estate right it, it o- over the course of this we see, I think we see Emma sort of break away from that mindset to seeing the person who's been in front of her her entire life. Right. Um, well, part of the reason I think the romance works in this is because it's tied to Emma's character growth and that she has these two men, um, don't remember either of their names, uh, <laughs> because that's how British and I know their faces. I can picture them right, right. now. Uh, Mr. Nightingale, was uh, that? Uh, Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley. Is, was her neighbor, who she ended up with. Right. Am, am I, uh... And then the other guy, um... I don't know. But... The other Churchill. guy... Frank Churchill. Churchill. Is, is the, the... The one guy. And it's not Knightley, I'm sorry. Knightley is her brother-in-law. Oh, who's... Who's the neighbor? Hold on. Technical difficulties, yeah, folks. Yeah, I... Uh, they don't have these in, like, order. Ugh. See, see, this is the problem with too many names in your movie. It really is. Oh, it is Mr. Knightley. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, Johnny so, Flynn as Mr. Knightley. So we have Churchill and Knightley. And Knightley. Yes. Um, Churchill is who Emma was at the start of this movie. He is arrogant, he is sure of his status, and he wants everyone to be like him. Um, and he's manipulative. He to, is. To, um, to gain, to maintain his status. He is engaged to a poor girl, but he's not upfront about that. Until he secures his inheritance. Because remember they say, if you don't marry a woman of means, you are cut out of the will. Yeah. So that was the whole thing of he... He was going to keep this secret until then. He's engaged to Jane until his aunt dies and he he gets his inheritance. And then he says, I've been engaged to Jane since October. It's, It's very messed up. While he's also courting Emma at the same time. Right. Like, so it is, yes, he is very manipulative, and it's all about status for him. Yes, but on the flip side is Knightley, who, yes, he's sort of, he's a bit arrogant in that he's constantly, um, 
what's the word? Like, criticizing Emma? I don't think he is arrogant. I think he... he He's doing it to try to better her. He is opinionated. He's not doing it to gain anything for himself. I don't think Knightley cares about his status. I mean, he cares about it in as much as he doesn't have to work. He doesn't have to, you know what I mean? Right. Like, he is rich. But I think he really, like... He's not flaunting it like the rest of the characters. He, I, I feel like he is a character who sort of has an idea of, we are the upper crust of society. Should we not be better than this? You know, shouldn't right. we be better people than manipulating people, than mm-hmm. doing things to just suit our own means? He, he tells Emma at one point, um, it would be better for you to have no sense than to misuse it. Right. Which is similar to how I imagine he feels about wealth, is you should be using it responsibly or not have it at all. Which you don't really see that he uses his wealth responsibly. Right. It's it is, just an opinion he has. It, it is th- this idea. But you don't see him also, you don't see him flaunting his wealth. He lives in this big house, which is largely empty. Like, yeah. he has, a lot of his furniture is covered up. I, I assume that's because he's an orphan. Uh, they he, never explicitly say, but they mention, like, his mom, and then they've got the covered up furniture. It, there is a, there's a sense that he ended up in this house by himself, and that he also has a closeness with Emma's family. They're sort of neighboring estates, I believe. Right. And... At the ball, when they go to dance, they go, we're not actual brothers. You get a sense they were sort of raised together. Not together together like steps. Yeah. But like that they they were very close childhood friends who grew up together. It's, it's like when you've got two families who are constantly together right. and then the, it, the kids are like cousins. Or... You get a sense, he, he, right, he probably was raised by people, not his parents, but was sort of looked after by the Woodhouse family. Was that it? I think so. Uh, yeah, the Woodhouse family. So... Um, so, be- because he does he does seem very familiar and very close with them. They're sort of his go-to place. Right. So these two boys are, like, opposites to each other, mm-hmm. both trying to get with Emma. And the thing I love, uh, it goes back to the picnic sing- scene. That's where it culminates in... Um, Churchill instigates the situation right. and is pushing Emma to be manipulative like him. Uh, and he doesn't even realize it. He's just enjoying himself. I don't think he's pushing her to that, but I think he brings it out of her. Yeah, it's like situational. Right. Um, And then Knightley, of course, like scolds her for it and is like, you know this is wrong. He puts an end to the game, you know. He it, does. It, immediately. And then he... Right, he goes and yells at her. After uh, they're away from everyone, right. though. And and really, you know, just sort of calls her out for being this spoiled uh, jerk. Who, right. Who is inconsiderate of everybody else. And I think without Knightley, um, she wouldn't have done the things that she did to make up for it. For sure. Like, you can see on her face, she knew that was wrong. She's contemplating it. She feels bad. But then, by the time she has that conversation with Knightley, she's already defending herself. Like, she's been building this up in her head. I, I, let me take that, let me take back my for sure. Because I do think she did feel bad. I don't know that she would have gone and apologized. But she, I, I feel like her defense of it was in a way of saying, you ever do something wrong and someone yells at you and you defend it, not because you think you're right, but you just don't want to get yelled at by that person. Or you don't right. you don't want to be seen as a whole by by all of the public as a villain or you, defined by this singular action. Right. You can you can know that you did something wrong and feel bad about it and just want everybody else to forget about it at the same time. Right. But I felt like this defense that she was putting up was so commonplace for her. Like this is what she's doing. In her head, every time she does something bad, right. is she's defending she it to herself. It. Yeah. Right. Um, and he pushes past that. And that is, like, the key to her self-growth. Right. We see her... Um, 
we see her butt up against him several times prior to this. And she always sort of justifies something. There's a point where he calls her out for for pushing Harriet to pass on uh, the, the minister who who was courting her. Yeah. And she kind of pushes her to pass pass on that proposal. And he calls her out on it. And uh, and like a, a couple scenes later, she kind of goes, she goes, we were both well-intentioned. Like she, it's, it's come, it's become very obvious that she was wrong, but she won't admit that she was wrong. She just says, we were both well-intentioned, so we were both right. And, and, and then she adds that... Um, that she's never been wrong. Uh, yeah, and yes. she she doesn't see the error. Like, and, and, and it's you, so but, you could have just left it at that, but, but she can, had to have that extra word in. You can see that that's exactly the opposite of what he does. He, she says, I'm never wrong. And you can see he wants to push back on that. And he just kind of backs away. He's like, I'm not going to get into this with her. Right, because he doesn't want to end this friendship. He doesn't want to get into a frustrating argument with her. But... At that, after that picnic, that is when he doesn't back down from her. And he, he goes up to her and, and really calls her out. And is like, you cannot justify your way out of, you know what I mean? Like, right. It is sort of, um, uh, I feel like this kind of story, if this was a brand new story today, um, this sort of. Use your words. I'm I'm (laughs) trying to, and I'm trying to be diplomatic too, because I don't want to be, I feel like there is a wave of feminist writing today that will not write a flawed female character this way. Okay. I I see. And, and to have her corrected by a man. I don't think Jane Austen was trying to say men, good women, bad. Jane Austen is trying to do For me, the most feminist thing that you can do with a character is what Jane Austen did, is she made this character deeply flawed and human and redeemed her. She was redeemed through her own actions, not through just being called out. That's why I think him going to her and yelling at her was not a... I think that was not a corrective action. I think it maybe brought it to the forefront of Emma's brain a little bit. But I think that she knew she had done wrong. And I do kind of think, I do kind of think she would have made amends for it on her own. I don't, I don't think it hinges on, on him yelling at her, but I think that was, that sort of moved things along a little bit. Right. I don't think this is a man correcting a woman. I think this is a woman coming to redeem herself. And she doesn't do it for a man. She doesn't... All of these things. She doesn't do this stuff to win a husband or win an estate. Right. I think it, this it's is, unrelated. I think this is why this is brilliant sort of feminist female character building. Is because Emma is a very human character. And in that picnic scene, I think we see the most humanity or the most human thing of her, the biggest flaw. We see her get cold and nasty. And it's not written as this, oh, bitches be cat fighting moment. Right. It, it, it is written as Emma's a spoiled brat and this is how she acts out. And she is learning how to not be this. Right. You know. I I didn't see it as like a man correcting her per se. I saw it as like the people you love make you better. Like they sure. they show you the error in your ways and she knew the error. And I think that that's a better way of putting it than than me cuz I don't think I don't think it's a man correcting a woman. That's, right. That's it's what it's I'm not a, yes. that instance isn't about gender. Um, I think this is a feminist piece because it prominently displays women uh, as people, which at the time was like never done. 
she is a main character who's a woman and she's flawed and she's someone that female readers can relate to. And it also sort of, I think, displays a spectrum of women. Emma is, I don't know if independent is the right word for a... Strong-willed? For, is a, that... for a rich, spoiled person. Right. But independent in the sense that she doesn't feel like... Um, I don't feel like she's in a rush to be married. I don't feel like she particularly mm-hmm. wants to be married. It, independent of thought? Would Inde- you say that? Yeah. She's just sort of like, I'm here because my dad doesn't want me to leave. But also because I kind of like it here. Right. And she kind of does what... She has a life where she is able to do what she wants, which was, I mean, for the time, had to be freakishly rare. Yeah. (laughs) But they also show women who are training to be married, training to be kind of subservient to men. Right. They show women who are at various places in society. You know, Right. We we see her sister's post-marriage. Right. And miserable. Yeah. But rich. I, you know, you see the the older woman who has sort of fallen from grace, and you see Jane, who is cultured but not rich. It's and not happy, and and very. Uh, oh, she, I we're, we're gonna talk about let, her. Let's talk about her because okay. she had a, such a small role in this, or a small, like not a lot of screen time. But there, she had one line in here that really just completely humanized her to me and, What's and made that? her so sad. I don't remember the exact line, but it's when she's leaving the party and she's like, my soul is exhausted. Right. She is, she does not like being paraded around. She does not like being the center of attention. She doesn't like the high society and it. It is what we know today is like being introverted and being dragged to a party. Right. She is feeling that, but it's almost like her duty to marry well. Do you think Jane is a self-insert? I can't decide because her name is Jane. Jane, right. And like that instantly red flags. She's talented. She's like great at everything. Could be. They show that she's a great writer and musician and dancer and singer. Um, I don't know. I don't know hardly anything about Jane Austen. I, 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 I honestly, right? I'm um, not trying to be. I don't want to come off like, oh yeah, well, like we're talking out of my ass. About I, it. I'm not an expert. I know she wasn't rich. Okay. So they have that in common, and she was talented, and specifically, she was not liked for her talent. I I don't know if Jane Austen was, but um, in the story. So it seems to me like she's a self-insert, but I don't... It's weird because she's kind of an antagonist. She's like a foil to Emma. She's a passive antagonist. She's not meaning to foil Emma. No, no, I know that. She's not... She doesn't mean anything. She just is. I think part of the reason Emma doesn't like her is because everybody else dotes on her. And it sort of sucks up the air in the room. But she's not doing it necessarily to show off. I mean, that piano recital was kind of a flex. But, uh, like, honestly, Emma invited her to. Because she thought she would look foolish. You know what I mean? Like, And that's on Emma. That is on Emma. That's exactly right. I, I don't think Jane does anything bad here. I mean, she is engaged to kind of a jerk, but... Right. I, she doesn't do anything to Emma. And so Emma, I think that's another, I think she's there to be another one of Emma's character flaws in that she dislikes this person who has done nothing to her. Right. You know. I, she's just such a interesting and in-depth character. And like the name thing again, it just seems too much of a coincidence. Yeah. Like there was a reason you named that character after yourself. You must have seen something. It's like how Tony Danza always plays someone named Tony. Sure. (laughs) I'll take your word for it. I don't know. It just seems strange to me. And then also, like, they hint that she has bad mental health. And I can't speak for Jane Austen, but I do know that women at the time 
typically did not have the best mental health or like I don't think anybody had good mental health. Right, but there. like if they showed any certain signs it was like hysteria. Or hysteria. Yeah. You're, the, you're, the you're going of, straight the, away the like yeah. Sure. Um yeah. Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Um I don't know. She was an interesting character that was sort of just sort of a background player. And yeah. and I thought I, I I thought she was actually a good addition to the story. She uh, was. Uh for for all of those reasons. Just just to be a plot device, but also a plot device with some depth. When mm-hmm. she just says, "If any, when people are missing me, tell them I've gone home." And all of, you know, Emma becomes very sympathetic to her at that at that time. You know, right. She, partly very curious, but she, I think, um, she's just sort of like, well, "What's going on?" You know, and it's it's one of those things where we gradually see Emma's humanity kind of get drawn out of her. Almost against her will. <laughs> right. You know. Uh, there's also the scene um, where she goes to apologize to um, the madam from the picnic. Yep. Um, and Jane is living with her. And um, she says, oh, she's not well. Um, and it, it just speaks to, like, this relationship between Jane and the woman that it's like, they care a lot about each other and they help each other. Um, and they're both kind of in the same, uh, they're in the same class. Right. Kind of. yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a kinship there. And I think there is a, I think Jane sort of represents to her, um, the idea of coming out of the lower class and, and ascending, not because she wants to ascend back to her class. I think she just has hope for Jane. Right. Yeah, and she's just sort of trying to nurture her. Maybe she's coaching her on how to get the you know mm-hmm. you know, get out of this small little boarding house we live in. You know, like, oh how exciting. Somebody sent you a piano. Like yeah. these these kinds of things. I don't know if Jane really wasn't well or she was just sort of uh, making an excuse for her. Um, but yeah, there, there is a lot of, of depth to... I, I think that's another interesting thing about this is all these little side characters, there's a surprising amount of depth to them. Like, right, they're real people. They're, exactly. They're real people, and I think that's doubly hard to do when they are the rich ruling class of of England, living right. in these palatial estates that, it, if you can get me to relate to somebody who's rich, and they even say to a lot of these people, like, you don't have any problems. They have to tell uh, uh, that one guy, Frank, they have to tell him, mm-hmm. like, you don't have any problems. You have, you're, you're rich, you're taken care of. Yeah, like, I, Emma tells her him to make up a problem. Yeah, make up a problem to make your life more interesting if you have to. And he's like, I'm not that rich. You know, he's like, I don't have it that well. And she's like, yes, you do. You know, it's like, <laughs> she completely calls him out on it. She's like, because she's she's rich and she has no problem. You know, she's right. calling him out. She goes, I know how we live. You know, you can't, <laughs> you can't sit here and complain. You're bored. Don't basically. be modest. Right. Like, his whole thing is he's going to leave England at a certain point, you know? And he's just bored, really, is what yeah. it is. It's, well, I mean, when you have everything. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really it. It's it's so easy to fall into this idea of uh, these people are, um, are just bored, rich people with no real problems. Right. It's so hard to build them as sympathetic, but this story actually manages to do that. And I, I again, it, it was complete surprise to me that I, uh, I connected to any of these characters, let alone as many of them as I did. I. It's a testament to Jane Austen, and also, um, because I know this is an adaption. Um, yes. Who, uh. Autumn. Autumn DeWild. He was the director. Uh, okay. And he has not directed much. Um, uh, Emma, The Postman Dreams, Play With Time, a lot of music videos. Um, 
And then it was written by Eleanor Catton. Okay. And Eleanor Catton has, only has three writing credits. Uh, she has this. She has The Luminaries, which is a like limited TV series. TV miniseries. And... Uh, oh, that's not even a writing credit. She has two... Um, two writing credits. And wow. this is one of them. Uh, I that's crazy that I mean they've done such a good job adapting um I mean I really can't speak to the adaption I just know this movie is good and the book is well loved and it was popular and it boosted Jane Austen's career so it had to be good um and you can see the remnants of characters that have been taken from the book Right. Like, I don't think they've done, I don't think this is a huge artistic liberty of changing up these characters oh, and adding so. depth. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I can't speak to it 100%, but it just seems like, yes, this is something, this is not just a love triangle. This is a story about people. Right. And I, I think you, that you get that from uh, sort of intimately knowing the source material. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say about this. I can't speak super in depth about, uh, Jane Austen or, uh, or anything like that. Uh, well, this uh, makes uh, me uh, want the, the, to li the literary sense of it, but I, I will just say, I really, I really enjoyed this movie. I know there was a, uh, an adaptation of Emma in the 90s starring Gwyneth Paltrow. I'm sure there have been half a dozen BBC. This may right. be a big... For all I know, in the in the, in the the wide berth of Jane Austen adaptations, this is like the low bar. People can look at this and go, that one's garbage. But I really enjoyed it. I really surprisingly enjoyed this movie. And uh, thank you for bringing it to the table. I never would have watched this. I... <laughs> This is what I wanted from this movie is an introduction to this world of Jane Austen. Uh, and I think like it's done that. that. Do you feel like like you feel like I, going to read a, a Jane yeah. Austen novel now? I, some of these scenes felt very much like book scenes. I know that doesn't make sense no, a whole it. lot, but like I felt at times like I was reading a book. So I feel like... There are things that sort of drag on film a little bit where you go, this is a, this is a book scene. Sure. Where where it's it's meant to be about inner monologue and a feeling that and in, that, instead they've it, turned that maybe to dialogue. Right. It isn't going to translate to film as well but, or something. But yeah. yeah, this this did its job. I want to read more Jane Austen. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Recommend the movie. I do recommend the movie. As do I. I, I don't think this movie is for everyone though. No. Um. Um, some people definitely will get bored, um, and maybe not connect with the characters in such a deep way. Sure. I would just say if you, if you're curious about this movie, I would recommend it. Uh, if you are opposed to this movie. Why? And, and, <laughs> well, I mean, I, like I said, I would not have watched this. This was a pleasant surprise to me. Um, right. But I, I think like, uh, guys, if your wife wants to watch this movie. <laughs> um, if you sit down and you are open to it and you can get over that hump of the first 20 minutes or so where you don't know what's going on, uh, I, I think you can be pleasantly surprised by this movie as well. Right. So, there you have it. Mm -hmm. Emma, with a period. Yep. Not a menstrual period. <laughs> no. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for clarifying. I, I just had to make sure they know. <laughs> They didn't even mention it once. That pivotal carry scene. She's in the locker room. They're just throwing pads at her. They're all gonna laugh at you. <laughs> Emma, cover up your dirty pillows. <laughs> okay, uh, that is gonna do it for our discussion. Oh, you have beautiful sets on you. Yes, art direction. I well, this, yeah, this is I. Great. Yeah. We about sum that up. Uh, let's move on to shout outs. What do you got this week? Uh, I have Sarah Zed. Um, it's Sarah Z, but she's Canadian, so I'm gonna pull out that Zed. Um, 
cultural appropriation. <laughs> I'm sorry to all the Canadians Can- I've offended. Cancel Austin. <laughs> I'll never be able to drink maple syrup again. Um, this is a weird recommendation, just in that I don't think her stuff is for everyone. Um, she does video essays, and they they tend to go from 30 minutes to... Uh, her most recent one was an hour 20, and she was like, I'm sorry, I tried to get it down, but there was a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, and she does... What, what does she do the essays on? Uh, most of the topics are about internet culture. Okay. Um, the, the one that really grabbed me was she did a video on personifying um, restaurants because Wendy's has a Twitter account, and they're oh, yeah. they're very sassy, right. and they like clap back at McDonald's, um, and so she was like, "Is this good? Is it right. propaganda? Is it very in depth advertising?" You, s- she goes into how you stop seeing them as corporations right. and start seeing them as your friend. That's um, that's, well, that's really interesting. She yeah. she does a lot of stuff like that, and yeah. like tumblr analysis and fan fiction um like the history of fan fiction i I assume that tumblr one is a couple years old i not really no but like she talks about old tumblr right um so that's it's really interesting if you're curious about what makes the internet the internet um there's probably a video in there that will interest you. That is interesting because not to sound like the old man in the room, uh, some things I just don't get. I don't get why certain things are a big deal. I don't, you know, right. uh, uh, I don't understand why everybody's mad all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone can answer that, Dad. <laughs> yeah, I, I really... Uh, You'll I, go to I, your I grave knowing that. People who just get on the internet simply to find something wrong. You know, go hunting for it. Right. Um, but yeah, something like that. Something like talking about corporate entities trying to not appear as giant corporate behemoths who don't care about you. It's, yeah. And that's very interesting to me. It, she, she also has a great way of talking. Uh, just like her cadence, like, draws you in. It's very podcast feel, because it's just her sitting in front of a camera drinking tea. Sure. Um... So I like her. She's fun. Cool. Yeah. Good deal. What do you have this week? Uh, I have a podcast that I recently guested on, uh, the Movie Go Round podcast. This is um, Brett Stewart. He has Tilting Windmill Studios, and this is sort of, I think, his flagship movie show. Uh, Brett Stewart and Nicole Davis and my old robot co-host, David Luzader, do a a themed movie podcast they will let one week they will let an audience the audience poll determine what they watch like pick the theme uh no they will like they will have a list of movies and the audience votes on oh, okay it. they'll do netflix roulette where they basically spin a wheel and let Ooh, that's uh, risky yeah it is um they do new uh what's what's the other one new to two where one one of the hosts picks something the other two haven't seen, uh, future classics, things that within they have to be within the last ten years that are going that we think that they think are going to be regarded as classics, you know, down the road, sort of timeless. Which is okay. Very interesting. Um, and uh, around the world, I think is their other one where they someone brings a foreign film to the table. E- each of those categories sounds it's very like, interesting. Yeah, it right. A, it brings a really cool mix to to the table, it, and all different kinds of movies show up there. Uh, we should start doing that. And, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, Forget that recommendation. Yeah, uh, we're starting yeah, a new uh, format. Yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, new to one. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was recently on for their Halloween series. They do movie ghoul round uh, leading up to Halloween. And I did their their foreign film that they picked was called Tigers Are Not Afraid. It's this Mexican independent film uh, about uh, kids running from a cartel and also encountering ghosts. And it's... It sounds heavy. It's 
it's pretty heavy. It's it's kind of a, a downer, but it was another one of those, you know, this small Mexican film that I had never heard of and I probably never would have seen. Uh, and I'm glad I did. I don't know that I'll ever watch it again. It's kind of a, a heavy movie. But it's, uh, it's just a really cool show. All three of those... Uh, people, David, Nicole, and and Brett are all three just really smart film people. Uh, they bring a lot of fun. There's a lot of comedy. There's a lot of just good discussion going on. I've been on it a couple of times. It's really fun to go on there and do it. And they're friends of mine from basically when I started podcasting. Uh, you know, I got to I got to know them from. Uh, group before that and then really got to know them we started podcasting together that's what i love Uh, about like the podcast community you you kind of you meet a lot of people and some of them stick uh right as you you go through and and uh yeah they've just been great i've seen their show in a couple different incarnations and it's just great to see them moving forward and continuing to put out uh, really, really great movie podcast. So that's that's movie go round on the Tilting Windmill Studios movie uh, go round uh, podcast network, and I will have links for both of these in our show notes. Sounds good. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Picture Show with Austin and Phil Rude. If you enjoy our show, please leave a review on your podcatcher of choice. It really helps our visibility and helps us grow the show. Another way to help us grow is to tell a friend, whether they're Victorian or modern day. You can tell them. (laughs) Whether they're a peasant farmer or a British aristocrat. Sorry, you have to make a certain (laughs) amount a year to be able to listen to our show. Oh, man. No wonder our listenership's down. (laughs) (laughs) This economy, am I right? This new rule, huh? (laughs) Uh, So, yeah. Yeah. Watch us. Let a friend know. Tell people. Please. I got the ball next week. What ball is that? That is Moneyball. That was perfect and not planned. We did not even plan that. Uh, We are watching the Brad Pitt film Moneyball. Uh, You made me watch a Victorian era period piece. I'm going to make you watch a sports movie. I hopefully you will be as pleasantly surprised as I was. It's not that much of a sports movie, honestly. You, You know, I'm not interested in sports. But uh, you know how Netflix plays uh, the little clip of the movie? Uh, I saw a clip of Moneyball, and I was like, okay, I'm kind of interested. We're going to talk about why I think it's an interesting movie next week. But uh, that is Moneyball. Uh, Jonah Hill, uh, Brad Pitt, I think Chris Pratt's in there somewhere. Uh, Like, early career Chris Pratt. Uh, Right. there's There's a handful of, I think, recognizable people. Who kind of became bigger later. So, uh, yeah. We'll have to watch the movie and see what it's all about. Watch along with us, please. Uh, Austin, you got some social media handles or anything you want people to look you up on? Yep. I am Austin and Rude on TikTok and Instagram. Or TikTok and Twitter. And then Instagram is the same thing. I don't know. Uh... <laughs> It's austin.n.rude. I messed that up. Uh, You'll find me if you look up my name. Okay, that was... Confusing. Confusing. (laughs) Confusing. Nobody knows where to find you. Oh, boy. And as we've learned in the last week, there are more than one Austin Rude out there. Um, I am at Phil Rude uh, on Twitter, at PhilRude75 on Instagram, at PhilTheBurn on TikTok, uh, (laughs) and PhilRude.com. You can get... All our episode information there. And if you look me up on social media, I tag Austin in like half my tweets. So you can find him through me. (laughs) Someone who doesn't mess up his social media. Austin, you want to read the credits? Yep. We did everything ourselves. There you have it. We'll see you next time on The Picture Show. See ya. We do this episode in accents? Uh, quite. You. It's quite a fun day, isn't it? <laughs>
I watch a crazy amount of British television, and I still can't do British accents. You didn't see anything this British. 